skill. Dan Grider, Probable Cause, July 21, 2024. It's Sunday night. Glad to have you with us. Another Sunday evening broadcast. This would be a little bit unusual, hopefully a little bit shorter. I know a lot of you are traveling, a lot of you up at AirVenture, and all that's really good. Um, we got a couple things to take care of here first, but I want to say a quick uh, thank you. I got a doctor's report to tell you about and a couple other things here to uh, check in on. Before we get to the accident statistics, we are doing really good. I'll flash this up on the screen right here. Here's July's data, but we're not going to get to that quite yet. I'll tell you what happened here this week. I went to the doctor. The doctor said uh, it's kind of like Groundhog Day. Uh, 12 more weeks of no being on this leg. 10 to 12 weeks is best guess here. Good news is I'm not in very much pain. I'm just not very mobile at all. But I want to say thank you to all you guys who've sent cards, letters, and insults via electronic means and via everything else. I'm going to call out a couple of those people here because I, I, I truly do appreciate um, a lot of that stuff that I've gotten via snail mail. Pretty cool here. I got this uh, nice letter from Drew Wilkins here. Thanks, Drew. And then I also got this uh, really nice letter from uh, Paul and Brenda Allen. And they sent this letter, but they also sent this book. I haven't had a chance to pick through the book here, but I think this is the B-24 that was lost in 1944. I think this is the basis for the story for Flight of the Phoenix. I've already looked through here a little bit. Very, very interesting kind of stuff. CT uh, down in Texas sent me this shirt. You've seen the name CT in the live chat uh, a lot before. CT sent me this shirt. I have no idea what it means, but he wanted me to wear it. Um, what, whatever it is, CT, there you go. It says BSP42. I think that must be something significant to CT, BSP42. So whatever it is, CT, there you go. And I appreciate the shirt. He also sent me a bunch of coffee, which is uh, totally good. Um... Here's a really cool thing. This thing got sent to me by Steve Meshke, my water ski buddy down in Florida. What this is, you know, when your leg gets damaged like this, uh, the doctor told me on a scale of one to six, category one through six, I was a category six, and it was compound. There was bone sticking through the skin. I just didn't know it. But uh, Steve, after I got out of surgery, sent me this thing. He said, you're going to love it. I had no idea what it was, but Drew set it up. This is a water pump that goes down in this container. It circulates ice cold water through this thing. It pumps this thing up and circulates water. This is the best thing since sliced bread this thing is absolutely making it comfortable it's reducing the swelling my left leg is still tighter than a drum head it's super tight a tremendous amount of swelling still inside my left leg but when i rest i keep this cool water jacket on it it's circulating cold water not freezing water just very very cold water it's reducing the swelling when the swelling goes down the pain goes down and that's helping a lot currently as of right now i am on zero drugs zero aspirin, zero Tylenol, zero anything. I'm keeping it elevated for the most part. I'm going to keep it that way, and I'm going to keep this water jacket on. This is especially uh, cool during the middle of the night. So all the rest of you guys, uh, Ms. Heidi, CT, Ms. Randy, Amy. Amy's out there. Uh, she took a new job. Here's a picture of her new position. She's a fire patrol person. She's actually a fire ranger out west. Here's a picture of all that. And then uh, Savino. Savino's in here tonight. I'll show you a quick picture. Savino's up at Oshkosh this week. Here's a picture of Savino's. Uh, she's doing quite a few talks up at Oshkosh. If you have a chance to visit this one on Tenerife, I was there for this one last year. Tenerife, this is spectacular. She's got a whole bunch of information on Tenerife. Some of the stuff that you've heard in the media about Tenerife is not exactly accurate. She has the inside track on Tenerife, and I think this year she's included some very, very pertinent takeaways for general aviation pilots, lessons learned from Tenerife, Tenerife that we as general aviation pilots can still use for today. I also got some big news I'm talking about before that. Uh, beating me to it is Dan Milliken, who has some breaking news. Here's his breaking news. Hey, everyone. This, in, uh, this just in breaking news is very sad. I like the way Dan Milliken addressed this breaking news. Here's Dan Milliken's breaking news. Hey everyone, this in uh, this just in breaking news is very sad. I'll get to Dan Milliken's breaking news here in just a moment, but before I do that, I do have breaking news that I'm going to tell you about, and I want you to hear it here first. I sold the DC3, and I want you to hear it 
here straight from me first. I sold the DC-3. You know, over the last five years, I've had quite a few offers on the DC-3. It's in spectacular shape. New engines, new props. It runs good. It doesn't use any oil. It's probably the best shape that airplane has been in in a long time. I have never really entertained the idea of selling it, uh, but just before the Lockheed accident, the Lockheed accident was June 17th, and just before that, I had a friend of mine come down, spend a couple days. He flew it. He wanted to see it. He went through the logbooks, and he made me an offer on the airplane. I turned him down. I did not accept his offer. It's probably the fifth offer in the last 12 months I've had for the DC-3. They're getting very rare, very very sought after aircraft. They are amazing airplanes for air shows, camping and flying around, doing whatever you want to do. He made me an offer. I did not accept it. After the accident, after June 17, about a week later, after I got out of the hospital, I called him back and I said, I accept your offer. This guy is going to take the airplane. He's going to flip it. He owns an auction company, a multi-million dollar inventory company, mostly tractors, trucks, bulldozers, and all that kind of thing. But he is an auctioneer. He, he inventories equipment, and he sells it. He's going to flip it. I know he's going to make a buck on the DC-3, and good for him. I'm going to help him do it. He's going to put this airplane up for auction. I'll give you a little bit more information on that. When it gets announced, this will be on his schedule, his auction. He's going to auction it off, and the DC-3 has got to go. It's been a long run. I've had the airplane almost 25 years. It's been a fantastic airplane. I really feel like I've gotten to do almost everything I wanted to do with it. I've given hundreds of people left seat opportunity rides in the airplane. And the DC-3 has just been fantastic. It's been a member of the family. I hate to see it go. But after the Lockheed accident, I knew what I was up against. And really, in the year 2024, I had already said that I'm coming up to the end of my season on the DC-3. It's, it's going to be time for it to go eventually. So I'll have more information on that eventually. I'm also going to, in the absence, since I'm not going to be doing DC3 stuff, I want to get into a little bit more music, video, documentary stuff. I want to do a little bit more video, documentary style stuff. We do have a documentary coming out. Me and Rob 2, Rob and Crystal 2 from Nashville, Tennessee, came down sometime in the month of May and we flew the DC-3. We shot a lot of footage and I went out and I flew the DC-3 single pilot. Nobody on the airplane except me. And we captured quite a few flights and quite a few things. I landed it on a 900 foot piece of grass. We captured all that. Rob is in the process of editing. If you want to see some of Rob's work, he's got his own YouTube channel, spectacular videographer, editor, genius and he and i are going to collaborate and put that video documentary together on the dc3 including some music and all that kind of thing in addition to that probably in the next 10 days i'm going to produce a video music video on the dc3 kind of amateur built myself called my old friend i'm going to show you a little bit of the inside of the dc3 uh, and give my uh, hand at uh, making a music video on the dc3 so that's my big news I apologize if you didn't get to fly it. It wasn't my first choice, but that's what it is. It is what it is, and life life is like that. Things come and they come and they go. I feel like I've had a very, very good long run with the DC-3 as an individual. I'm not a multi-gazillionaire. I'm not a multi-millionaire. I'm not even a 100 air. So for me to have the opportunity to have had that DC-3 and fly it as much as I have over the years, it's been totally good. So that's my big news. Now I want to cut to Dan Milliken and show you Dan Milliken's news, his earth-shaking, breaking, breaking news from Dan Milliken. Hey, everyone. This in... Uh, this just in breaking news is very sad. When I flew to a location last month, um, while it was sitting on the ramp, uh, they sent me a picture of the front strut had collapsed and I had fluid all over. So yes, I s must have slipped the lower O-ring that's in here. But um, they were able to repair it and they charged me a lot of money. And um, they wouldn't repair it that day because we were too close to the closing time and they said it would be $500 a person just for a call-out fee before they even start doing the labor. And they needed two people for the job. So I couldn't do that. Then they charged me a lot for replacing the O-rings and everything here. And then they charged me $200 for nitrogen. And then they put in a low pressure valve and it's been leaking and we haven't been able to figure it out. Now we know, come on guys. You know, last week I had an opportunity to come, uh, do a couple of videos. Dylan and I did a ride-along video concerning wrong way in the traffic pattern. If you get a chance to go back and look, that video will stay up and on the air. This has to do with communication in the traffic pattern and how to communicate, communicating with 
other people. The other video that uh, that we uh, did last week, we uh, we want to highlight, and that has the, to do with the Oshkosh EAA, the culture, the safety culture, and I want to talk about this situation. One, November one nine four five Delta. This is 1952 model Bonanza that went into Oshkosh just the other day. I got the tape and the radar track. Notice this guy hasn't flown his airplane for six months. He lives in New Mexico. Now he brings it up to Wisconsin. He starts uh, uh, his trip in New Mexico. He ends up in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And then he tries to hop it up on the Ripon Fisk arrival into Air Venture. Everything is good until they tell him that he's going to have to turn left and enter the hold over the lake. Not the news that he wants to hear. Listen to what he manufactures. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I call BS. This guy, as soon as they gave him the hold, he manufactured an engine problem. Listen to this. My VTL, let's uh, start at a left turn to the north a little bit now. Okay, that's for Yes, the lowing. I'm sorry if I'm calling you a veto and you're not uh, the lowing. There you go. That looks great. Um, go ahead and start a left turn back to the west now. Go back to Green Lake. Rejoin. Find someone to follow. It's going to be about 30 to 45 minutes for a mouth arrival. Yeah, Bonanza's got engine problems. You have engine problems? Oh, uh, we lost fuel pump or something. Roger, on the follow the uh, railroad tracks for runway at 27 into the right downwind. Runway at 27 to keep it tight, right downwind. We'll let the tower know you're going to have runway 27. It's a 118.5. Do you need any assistance at this time or just uh, expedite to the airport? Oh, uh, just give me a vector to the runway. I'm running on the fuel pump right now. Roger, uh, continue along the railroad tracks. Do you see the railroad tracks off your right side? Yeah, I got it. Okay, um, make a straight into runway 9. Do you have runway 9 in sight? We, uh, we have the runway. Now, because he has an engine problem, the female controller, she gets all excited, sends him direct to the airport. She also makes a phone call and gets approved. They're using runway 27. They've got airplanes stacked up everywhere for runway 27. They give him straight into runway 9. He's not good on the radio. And look at his ADSB track here. He goes straight in on 9. He overflies the tents on runway 9 at like 7 feet over the tents on runway 9. He uses full length. Uh, this is the kind of guy that should not be flying an airplane into Air Venture. I don't think he had a fuel pump problem. I don't think there was any kind of a problem at all. I think he manufactured a fuel emergency, never did declare an emergency. And here's the problem I have with EAA air traffic control. Nobody declared an emergency. You can't allow opposite direction, wrong way landing unless somebody declares an emergency. In his case, he just said he had a problem and they gave him wrong way I think that needs to be looked at. I think they need to pull his maintenance records and take a look at this guy. I don't think there's anything wrong with the engine-driven fuel pump on this 1952 model Bonanza. After he landed, here's the here's the final sign-off here where he says, sorry for the inconvenience. Bonanza, my uh, V-tail Bonanza, don't forget your gear there, sir. And uh, you can contact tower 118.2. Call the tower. I'm sorry, 118.5 for the tower, my V-tail Bonanza, okay? 18.5 on the tower for 9. Thank you. Have a great day. Is there anyone else uh, experiencing any issues at this time that's uh, approaching fifth? Tower of Bonanza 1954 Delta is with you for nine. Uh, we lost our main engine fuel pump. Delta 1954 Delta, Roger Runway Niner, cleared to land. Clear to land, Niner. Wind 2905. Honda 1-5, you probably heard that there's aircraft landing in opposite direction, already pre-coordinated, uh, land on runway 9, so you are, uh, can continue for 2-7, we'll be in delay for you, just want to give you a heads up. November. Okay, thanks, Honda 1-5, continuing 2-7. Yeah, Honda Jet 1-5, cancel, disregard. Yeah, Honda Jet 1-5, cancel land clearance, continue inbound, and, uh, reduce your speed just to 170 or less, please. 170 or left, continue inbound, hunt up, 15, cancel landing. And Honda 15, I guess the separation is a little tighter than my thoughts, so reduce the final approach speed. Following the final approach speed, Honda 15.
Alliance 319077, just inside Primo. Number 977, Roger, report two mile final. I'll call you two out, 977. Bonanza 5 4 Delta, right turn into the grass and have a good day. Okay, sorry about all that. Bonanza 5 4 Delta, start your right turn now. I'll put the data on the screen here. This is July. This is what you came here for, July 2024 data. We are still doing good. Here's the fatals. We only had three since last week, but look at this summary down here. In 2023, as of July 21, last year, we had 96 fatals. As of today, July 20, 20, July 21, 2024, we've only had 73. That's still 23 less. We're sitting here at 10.96 fatals per month. Remember, the national average is 18 per month. We're down here at 10.96, and we're already halfway through, better than halfway through the month of July. We're doing a lot better. We're flying more and fatals less. Let's take a look at uh, a couple of the accidents on here. I want to talk about the uh, November 3464 Delta. I now have a name. That was John Hendricks, age 40. This is a loss of thrust on takeoff out in the state of uh, Washington. Um, and then the... Uh, November 81250, this is the PA-28-150-161. I said wing fall off. I don't know yet. Um, still no preliminary from the NTSB, but I thought it was interesting. The, uh, a person in the audience did ask the NTSB guy. She said, tell us what a touch-and-go is, and here's what his answer is. Can you explain for people who may not be familiar what it means when you say they're doing touch-and-go? Sure. Um, so whether different phases of their training. Um, if they're practicing uh, just to fly an airplane, they may come in and just practice a landing, and then they'll turn around and go back to the runway and take off, and they're just practicing takeoff and landings. I don't think that's a good answer for the question, what is a touch and go? And then he went on to explain an annual. He's saying that in order to do an annual, you have to take the airplane apart. Not true. We don't take airplanes apart. We inspect, and there's a few little places that you can look and shine lights and mirrors. We don't take airplanes apart for an annual. Aviation is very safe. I mean, these aircraft, you, you take a, a 1945 aircraft that actually was sitting out here earlier fueling up, those aircraft are required to go through extensive inspections once a year. So a mechanic, a licensed airframe and power plant mechanic has to completely take that airplane apart. They inspect everything. They're looking for corrosion, wear, tear. The engines are controlled by the manufacturer that after it reaches a certain uh, flight hour or a calendar date that they're required to be pulled off, completely overhauled. So aircraft are maintained up to a much, much higher standard than any automobile or boat or anything like that. So aviation is, is, is very safe to fly, yes. Really, the only three since last Sunday night. I'll go over these uh, very quickly. The Cessna 402 Bravo. These are two multi-engine fatals and one caravan fatal. The very last three here. This is a 402. It's an air sampling, air quality testing, University of Maryland something airplane, single pilot. It was flown by a guy named Robert Merlini, 56 years old. I think he had an engine problem. He was only moving the airplane from one airport to the other. Day VFR, weather's perfect, nothing wrong with the airplane, but he put it into the water. This should have been able to go into the water. If he did have a problem, should have been able to go into the water, gear up, full flaps, and slide to a stop, just like Sully, no problem. I don't know how this airplane ended up. It broke it into as many pieces as it did. It kind of looks like a VMC rollover, loss of an engine, trying to make it to the runway, and I think he VMC rolled the airplane, but... Don't know yet. The next one is the Duke. This is a very unusual airplane. I've flown the Duke. This guy had altitude. He had enough altitude and energy to do two complete steep 360s over the approach end of runway 32. Ended up going long and tried to go around. Left engine had the problem. He ended up off the left side of runway 32 at the very, very far end of the, of the runway. Completely mismanaged his, en his energy. This is mishandling an abnormal. He had an abnormal of some kind. Okay, that's fair. You should be able to close both throttles and get that airplane down to the ground. You still got one engine that's working okay. You should be able to touch down someplace on this runway. Single engine, no problem. A single engine go around in a Duke is not pretty, and this is the way it ended up. This also looks like a VMC rollover. The very last one is the 208 Caravan out in uh, New York. This is uh, near Niagara Falls. 
tragic story. The young lady's name was Melanie Georgia, 26 years old. The 206 had already flown multiple skydive loads that day. She ended up dropping her skydivers and making her descent. I don't have the flight path. I don't have any information or any witness or anything like that. I don't understand. The Cessna 208 is basically a 172 times 10 fixed gear, durable, big, huge wing on the thing. I don't know how you crash a 208 day VFR. I don't see it, but uh, this will be a complete mystery on how this one happened. I am a pilot. I'm a jump pilot. And I'm a skydiver. Here's a little bit of video of me flying flight shops. I used to own a drop zone. I've t done a ton of jumping and I've been a jump pilot. I fully understand the jump pilot skydiving world. Here's me making a descent in the King Air after dropping skydivers. Oh my God. Watching Trista jump with no hesitation was inspiring. She clearly loved it. And if you're wondering how we got down, the next episode will cover the insane descent procedure Dan uses to avoid the skydivers while beating them to the ground. After Trista's first jump, Brock and I got to experience the insane ride down. Okay, I guess, all right, Brock's good. Oh yeah, you're not kidding, eh? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> That's crazy. So I just talked through the procedure of what you just did. You pulled the power back, you just got kind of almost did a wing over. Yeah, it's just not really a wing over. Uh, jumpers are back there. So all we gotta do is stay out of their path. And then the airplane's coming down about 7,000 feet a minute. What a rush. Wow, that's crazy how fast it got down. Oh yeah, are we gonna beat them down? Most likely. All right, final gear check is good. We're beating them down. There, there comes your canopy just coming in right there. <laughs> I'm a pilot. I'm here to like learn about the nerdiness of the flying stuff, but now they're telling me they're gonna make me jump. I think you should. <laughs> Before taxiing, Dan gets flight summary data from ground ops. I'm at 9,400 pounds gross weight. What's the max? 10-1. So is this another day in the office for you? Another day in the office. This is actually easy. Turbines are really, really simple. There's no carbs you can check and no bags. No run-up. No run-up. This is going straight to 12,000 feet. Now we're going to go straight up, take them out, and straight back down. Very cool. So it's kind of like scaling up what a tow pilot does for gliders, right? Yep, except the objective on this is to get them up to altitude at the correct geographical position and then get the aircraft back down again uh, as quick as it can. So how do you uh, figure out where you're supposed to be with the whole upwind situation? I got it on a map here. He's, he's asked for a 220 jump run. See how I can slew this yep. line around. I've already, I've already built a uh, course in here and that'll, uh, that'll put us right on the line. We'll cross directly over the top within about 50 feet of the landing zone on that path at the correct altitude. I'll give them the signal, see them back to the red and green light. Yep, okay, yep. That, that's how I control when they can open the door. Okay. And that's how I control when they can leave. Salt Springs, King Air's departing 1-8 Salt Springs. All right, last look at the gauges. Everything else is good. Boost pumps are on. Auto feathers on. Everything else is good. That's your panel is clear. Generators are ginning. This airplane is a rocket. Yeah, wow, we're already at 100. <laughs> That's awesome. They make the ride start right away for them. Oh yeah. Make it fun. Absolutely. How many gallons of barf you think you've cleaned up in your lifetime doing this job? Not a lot. No? No. It's pretty rare, really. That's good. 
Razorback, Sky Ridge 90, Mike Victor. My hope is for the best for Air Venture. Uh, it's 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 always a, a gamble. It's it's a roulette wheel. I hope they slow down. I hope you controllers up there speak slowly, speak clearly, keep the traffic separated. There's no need to talk fast and act like a movie star. Speak slowly, speak clearly. You guys fly in your airplane. You fly your airplane first. Don't let them tell you when to put your gear down. Don't let the controller fly your airplane for you. You configure when you want to configure. Don't get out of your normal routine. You do what you want to do when they tell you to tighten it up, tighten it up, keep the turn going, keep the turn going. Don't do it. You fly your normal downwind, base, and final like you want to. Spacing is their problem. They can peel somebody out or widen somebody out if they need to. You fly your own airplane. Watch DMS. Don't stall your airplane in the downwind at the traffic pattern just because the controller was yelling at you. They like to yell, they like to talk fast, and they like to be the big guy up at AirVenture. That's all really cool, but remember, it's your life. You're in that airplane, not them. I watched a guy kill himself, base to final, on 2-7 several years ago. Downwind, base and final, and the controller yelled at the whole time, tighten it up, tighten it up, tighten it up, and he did. He tightened it up, and they're both dead in that Cessna 150. Be very careful up there at AirVenture. Let's keep our fingers crossed and hope for the best. I hope we can come out of there without a fatal this year. We'll see. I... I have no idea, but uh, I think there's a lot of room for improvement, a lot of room for cleanup. You let me know what you think of the 1952 model Bonanza and what he did. Is that guy legit or what? I'm thinking no. I don't think I don't think that was a legit deal at all. I gotta get out of here. Let's get this video up and on the air. Thanks for hanging in here with us tonight in the live chat room. Make sure you say hi and I'll look for you guys again next week for my tiny little itty bitty fledgling YouTube channel, Dan Grider probable cause. They were able to repair it and they charged me a lot of money.